Hey folks, welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. This is the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to help spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. I want to ha- introduce myself so that you know who you're listening to or watching. Uh, my name is Corey Johnston. I'm a laborer in rural Saskatchewan in Canada. I grew up between a family farm and a small community of about 10,000 people, and I eventually moved to a small city of about 230,000 people. Most of the people here are conservative and right-wing with many that would be considered far right. I'm different from that. I'm an anarcho-communist, an atheist, and a skeptic. This means that I try to follow ideas that are better for everyone, uh, but I also try to base those ideas on the best evidence available. As an anarchist, I believe that all people are equal and deserve to be treated as such. Uh, No one is above another, and systems that put people above each other in value are not systems that I can endorse. When you hear anarchists talk about hierarchy, this is what they mean. As a communist, I believe that everyone is entitled to a good life and all things belong to all. There is nuance to this, but above all, it entitles everyone to a safe and good life free from coercion. As an atheist, I am agnostic. It's not just that I don't believe in any god or gods, but I also believe that the claims people make about the god or gods they believe in are inconsistent and often incoherent. My anarchist tendencies mean I try not to judge others for believing things that aren't true or evidence-based, but with my mix of tendencies, I do also try to help people reach the best ideas and come to the best conclusions for everyone, rather than just supporting the status quo or being purely self-interested. I've been podcasting for almost 10 years now. I started with the atheist and skeptic communities in 2013, though I eventually moved on to more progressive communities and spaces as the toxicity and reactionary tendencies in skeptic spaces became more apparent. I do believe that a good skeptic will land on libertarian or anarchist ideals, but nobody who follows the evidence can say that capitalism is good for the world or humanity. I've only been working with video for a couple of years, and I hope that my channel can grow and build a community like some of those I've seen around other channels. However, I don't live online. I have children, a partner, a job that is demanding, and an aging parent who sometimes needs my help. This means my schedule for production is inconsistent. I hope that you will bear with me and that you enjoy my work. I have many ways that you can support this channel, and I always have other projects on the go. So look in the show notes or description box to check those out as well. My Patreon is patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, and I deeply appreciate any support you can send my way. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact me through any social media platform or by email at mindofaskepticalleftist at (laughs) gmail.com. All right. Hi, and welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm joined by Michael Dean from the Blue Cross Movement. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> How are you today? I'm doing just fine. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. For sure. So I guess a good place to start is like, who are you and what is the Blue Cross Movement? Um. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Michael Dean, and I'm from Texas. I was born and raised in Southeast Texas. Uh, <clears throat> my apologies. The Blue Cross Movement is a proposal that I started creating uh, during the George Floyd riots. And initially, it was a proposal for uh, justice and police reform. And the Blue Cross comes from uh, the proposal to remove the blue stripe, which I see as a divisive symbol. And, re- and replace it with a blue plus sign that has a, uh, a yellow equal sign in the middle to symbolize positive equality. I do get a lot of kickback on the blue cross thing because uh, uh, it, seem, it seems like it's a religious thing or tied to the medical insurance company, which it's neither. Uh, but blue plus sign movement sounds really dumb. So <laughs> I went with the uh, blue cross movement. Um, no, that's fair. But that's the, the gist of it or at least the, uh, the beginnings. And from there, uh, I really, I just kind of kept delving into the injustices of our society and not just, you know, uh, from a, a pointing fingers uh, approach, but from a solutions-based approach to where I was trying to find solutions to everything along the way. And that's how the entire movement evolved into what it is today. Okay. Uh, how how kind of big is the movement? Like, do you have a <clears throat> pretty not- decent... It's not big as far as people following me or people uh, that are supporting it at this time. I mean, it's still just, uh, you know, my baby or whatever. But as far as the solutions uh, uh, and and what that encompasses, it's pretty much a full set of dynamic solutions to transition 
us from our text-based society to a resource-based society of true freedoms. And it's kind of hard to explain, uh, but uh, if anybody wants to watch that resources video, which is the latest one on my channel, it's about 30 minutes long. It's kind of boring, but it, it just lays it out clear and clean as it, as it can be. Yeah, so in that video, you kind of talk about how like the competition for resources seems to be uh, a, a pervasive problem throughout history and throughout society. Uh, what is uh, like an example of what how to deal with that? You know, there's a material scarcity ploy, and then it's pretty much everything is just a battle for resources anyway, because as far as we can see, uh, resources equals wealth, and wealth equals power, and power equals freedom. And we, the people, don't really have any of that. So if right. we want the power to have the freedom, we need the resources for the wealth to, to have all of that. So in order to do that, uh, the proposal is to establish mineral rights and data rights, uh, which is basically, you know, the rights to the resources of our nation, uh, which gives everybody basically, uh, you know, their fair share of the pie. It's a uh, it's. An alternative to UBI. So instead of saying UBI, we would say a national inheritance compensation. And uh, basically how that would work is um, how we all on every uh, pipe or meat or excuse me, wire coming into our homes, there's a meter on it and everything we use is metered. Uh, but when these uh, big corporations take these leases uh, to get minerals or oil, there's no meter on the you know, the, the, the amount that they're able to extract. So essentially we'll be putting a meter on every uh, pipe or quarry coming out of the ground. Right. Right. Yeah. Like, uh, almost a nationalization of, uh, resources is kind of the idea. Yeah. I mean, pretty much, uh, you know, and I hate to put like labels on it because I am trying to attract every type of voter and not just leftist. So when we start Fair. talking like that, it sounds like socialism and, you know, as far as all labels go, I don't care about any of them. They're all garbage as far as I'm concerned. We're either working towards, you know, peace and prosperity for all people or we're not. So that's where I'm at. And as far as labels are concerned, uh, it doesn't matter. I don't process things in, you know, in those terms. <clears throat> oh, that's fair. I just, uh, it seems pretty clear that some people are not for that. <laughs> and some people are, right? Well. That's why in that video I go into, you know, I'll be like, what's the other side of the coin look like? You know, because right now we say capitalism is the best way, but look around. What's what's really going on, you know, with the school shootings and, you know, the water shortages and the soil depletion and the air pollution, uh, you know, and a lot of people, you know, are on the uh, the climate hoax side of it. And I'm not trying to turn right. away anybody. So I kind of have to uh, play the middle ground and not that I'm saying I deny the climate change. Uh, I think it's kind of a, a strange stance to take. I, I mean, like we know the dinosaurs were here before us and now they're gone. So there's a chance that we could be here and then not be here anymore. So we have to at least fight to, uh, you know, to cater it to our needs. If, if it's not, you know, uh, actual a runaway, you know, climate disaster. Right, right. Even if one isn't concerned uh, on the level that, say, an environmentalist might be, you got to yeah. acknowledge that this is a, a thing we should take care of. <laughs> yeah, it would still be bit more beneficial to our health if there was a higher level of oxygen in the atmosphere. The plants would grow bigger and stronger, you know, and uh, and produce more. We would be just healthier as beings. All the animals would be healthier. So it's not just about whether it's an environmental crisis or not, there's, you know, health, uh, you know, health matters involved in all of it. Yeah, for sure. I, it may, i that makes me think of uh, a few years ago, there was an article, uh, a study that was done about this uh, forest uh, where they really, they pumped a bunch of CO2 because one of the defenses against climate change is that uh, plants use CO2. So the more CO2, the better our forests and plants do. But they pumped all this CO2 in, into a, a controlled environment. And uh, it basically reached a peak level where they could use it. And then after that, it became detrimental to them. So, and at, and in our current environment, like it sounds like we're reaching that peak level where like uh, plants can't actually use as much carbon dioxide as is in 
the atmosphere right now. <laughs> so it, it's, uh, yeah, yeah it's, it, it would be good for us to ign- look at that. <laughs> yeah. Everybody looks at, you know, the statistics and they watch, you know, a ramp moving at a certain rate, but they don't understand that it's, you know, it's asymptotical. Once it hits a certain point, it's just going to start accelerating right. higher and higher at a more <laughs> rapid rate. So it's not going to continue on that little ramp that they're looking at. Uh, so it's, you know, if you don't really know math and statistics, it's not good to, you know, base your argument off of whatever graph you're looking at. Uh, yeah. 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 There's always that peak level where it's like, okay, now it's bad. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm more concerned with, you know, anybody that's familiar with the uh, process called titration. You know, if we hit just a certain point and then boom, it just, everything changes in almost an instant. So that happens. That's a, you know, that's, that's a, a part of the nature of science and everything. So that's a possibility. And I would hate to see something like that happen to where we're like, once again, thinking we're just on this trajectory. And as long as we do something along here, you know, and it doesn't go here, but then before we even get there, it just starts skyrocketing up. And that could be a really, really bad problem. Yeah, uh, for sure. But I like to stay on the on the uh, optimistic side, the positive side, keep the faith because there's definitely enough nihilists out there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no. And it it can be pretty easy to fall into that kind of like, oh, this everything's going to fall apart. It's all going to we're all going to die kind of mentality if you don't keep at least some hope in a little bit of people, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's still yeah, good I've people heard. who still care. So <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're out there. Of course, the, the media doesn't focus on the uh, the good things as much as they do the bad. And I'm not saying it's a conspiracy or anything, but it's just right. what gets more clicks. I mean, obviously, even if you go on Twitter, you'll see people sharing more uh, detrimental things and they're sharing the, the positive things. Even, yeah. you know, people in the blue wave are going to share more things about Trump in a day than they do about Biden, even though it'll be in a, in a negative uh, stance. They're yeah. still promoting him more. Unfortunately. Well, that's part of why they say that uh, Trump won in the first place, right? Is because of the media focus on him. He kept making these things then they were like, ah, oh, yeah, let's talk about it. It's got to be talked about. So he got more attention and in the attention economy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no publicity is bad publicity. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, that's an old, that's an old thing. Yeah. In I don't journalism, agree right? with it a hundred percent, but it's, uh, I mean, there's something yeah. there. There's something to it. It's definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the idea like within journalism too, like, uh, if it bleeds, it leads was the old adage. Like that's how, that's how you sell yeah. papers. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, you know, that's what, uh, tugs at the heartstrings. And- so I guess uh, within your Blue Cross movement, you're also running for president, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I hate that because um, it's kind of it's kind of a weird thing. Nobody should want to be president. I don't want yeah. to be president. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, it has such a weird feeling to it. Uh, but anyway, it's, just, it's kind of like King and Queen 2.0. Is how right. Thinking. Like we should be yeah. uh, looking up to a single individual like that. So I don't, I'm not approaching it like that. The way I'm approaching it is that, you know, the entire country was calling out for solutions. The entire country is saying, hey, be the change. Somebody needs to step up. We heard, you know, during before the 2020 election when it was uh, Biden and Trump going after it. Most people were like, hey, can just anybody, any one American stand up, you know, and just, you know, something. And, right. uh, you know, I just kept hearing that over and over again. And I was like, look, you know, somebody's got to do something. So um, I was just, just like, hey, what would it look like if somebody just made the perfect campaign from where we're at to where we should be leading on the pinnacle of human innovation rather than what drives profits? Uh, you know, so I just did that and on a people based or focused, uh, you know, uh, mission and I came up with all of these solutions and they're all completely feasible. Actually, we could have been doing all of them since the 50s and be uh, where I'm talking about right now. So I am talking about fast forwarding to a true uh, utopian space age. Most people are like, those are all bait words. You know, none of that can be true. Whatever you're saying, you're just trying to get, uh, you know, clicks or whatever. I was like, it's really not. It is what it is. If you look at it and you look at the material, it, uh, it's all completely written out and, it, and it's completely feasible. So. Right. We can do it. Um, so anyway, um, as I was saying, 
I developed the plan and really I sat on it for almost a year and a half and I didn't, and I was still embarrassed. I was like, Hey, what do I do with this? What do I say? You know? And I was like, and if I give it over to anybody or I was like, Hey, let's run with this. I was like, somebody's going to mess it up. You know, they're just going to, they're going to mess it up. So at that point I was like, if, um, if somebody else produces a better plan, then obviously their heart is in the place to, uh, you know, to, to take that position. And until then I'm going to, you know, take the position of running for president in 2024, because I feel like that is the best plan for our country and our future. And if anybody produces a plan that is obviously superior to that, I will happily step down. And that's what the whole running for presidency thing should be. It shouldn't be this whole mudslinging uh, yeah. you know, competition. It should be, hey, who's really has the best interests of our country in mind and at heart? And let's go with that. I'm trying to change the land, the political landscape a little bit, even though, you know, a lot of people laugh me off as, as a joke. You know, I'm a nobody running for president. And I get that. Uh, we get that from a lot of people. But at the same time, I'm putting forth an earnest effort to to try to, you know, be the change and and, uh, and facilitate that change or or illuminate a path to to get to that change. No, well, that's fair. I I'm not. Uh, I'm pretty anti-established parties, so <laughs> so people who would laugh at uh, an ex uh, person who's running for president who doesn't have any support yet, like I don't think that's really fair. I'm not a big fan of presidents as a whole, anyway. Yeah, but it's not. But fair. like, they're but the like, same people that would say yeah. that they are anti-career politician. I was like, well, but then you'll say you don't, you wouldn't vote for me because I don't have any political experience. Right. You kind of, you gotta, you gotta. Find your the same, medium. yeah. <laughs> they keep they keep voting for career politicians, and they keep supporting career politicians. Yes, and then somehow then they take career politicians. I was like, yeah. well, you know, they don't vote for themselves. I mean, they do, but that doesn't get that doesn't keep them in office. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah so I mean, so go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was just thinking, like, it's it's kind of a a strange dynamic to be like an outsider actually trying to run in a system especially as as like uh focused on two parties as the United States is the duopoly yeah, yeah. like it's it's yeah. very narrowly focused yeah and i was just hoping and that's why i uh, oriented everything around solutions that could be that were so dynamic and enticing that it would be agreeable to everyone and i'm happy to uh add, to report that that has successfully worked and that I do uh, gain the interest of, you know, Trumpers, leftists, uh, centrists, uh, green voters, youth voters, even people that are non-voters. Uh, you know, when they see this, they're like, hey, I will vote for that. So that and I and I was seeing that over two years ago. So even seeing that, I knew I was like, there's an opportunity for unity here. It is possible. Mm -hmm. And now you could. Even today, you can go talk to, you know, the majority of the people out on the street and ask them, hey, do you think we could achieve a unity in America? And they'll be like, no, never, not right. a thousand years. But absolutely, we can. And I have this little, uh, you know, this little movement that proves it. So if we put some some uh, some heart into it, put some wind under the wings of it and uh, let it get off the ground. But I'm uh, once again, I like to stay uh, optimistic and 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 faithful. So. Not in a religious sense, just in a you know terms of humanity succeeding. Uh, you yeah. know, I, I keep my faith uh, strong in that. Um, but so I'm curious. yeah, I'm just curious. Like, uh, did you uh, did you think about uh, kind of approaching like uh, existing organizations like that are also outside of the mainstream, like uh, anarchist groups or left wing like uh, like communist groups? I know you're not looking for labels, but if you have ideas. Yeah. And their people are amenable to them, then it might be. Uh, did you consider that? No, yes, I approach everybody, and the idea of unity is not exactly appealing right now. While people have, uh, you know, when they're so invested in this, you know, last two or three years battle of, you know, pinpointing their hatred for the opposition, so they know exactly why they hate them now, you know, and it's like they got the taste of blood. So nobody wants to say what now, now I'm going to be friends with these guys. And, you know, so I'm not going to say nobody's reasoning. It's not isn't valid. I'm just saying. And if they watch that resources video, let's say at the end is, you know, I think what we're going to have to do as a nation is decide whether or not our vengeance is worth our grandchildren's futures. 
because that's right. what's at stake right now. We're not making choices for ourselves right now. We're making choices for our children's children. We're we may be affecting our present, but we're affecting their entire future. So, you know, we can go out with with our uh, with our greed or you know concerns with our vengeance or getting you know getting back at whoever harmed us, or we can put it aside long enough to make some real progress and secure a future for the future generations that they deserve. And uh, I really think that everything else right now can, can be put aside. We're at a moment where it's crucial enough to put it aside and, and focus on progress. I wonder like uh, a big, a big issue right now is like uh, uh, the pro choice movement, right? And I wonder how you do you build a bridge between somebody who believes that women should uh, carry to term any pregnancy and someone who believes that they, women should have uh, the choice to abort it or not. I, 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 I find that it's hard to have a communication between those two sides. I wonder like if you, if you have uh, uh, an insight into that. In uh, August of 2018, me and my wife were pregnant and the fetus went non-viable at about seven or eight weeks. We didn't really know. My wife had started spotting and, uh, you know, we didn't pay it too much mind, uh, but we went and got checked out and I don't know, I guess we made it through somehow, but anyway, either way, by the time she was 15 weeks, we made it to a maternity clinic to get a sonogram and there was no heartbeat and they determined it was non-viable. So at, and that it had, had went non-viable at about eight weeks. So the fetus had been deceased inside my wife for seven weeks. And wow. we were in a, a red county in Texas. And the people at the clinic told us, uh, you need to go to the emergency room and get an emergency DNC right now. And we're like, okay. So we go to the emergency room and explain to them what happened at the clinic and everything that came there. And they looked at us kind of with disgust and we're like, um, you know, we don't do that here. And I was like, what, what do you mean? I was like, this is a medical facility. I was like, you know, this isn't a, uh, and it, it was kind of clicking on me that, she, you know, they were looking at it in, tor- in terms of an abortion rather than right. extracting, you know, this non-viable uh, fetus from my wife. Uh, but long story short, um, anyway, they had done a, an internal sonogram just to verify everything we were talking about. And they were like, yeah, and like, well, you're going to need to go home and let nature take its course. Uh, but one of the nurses thought she was being nice and she did a, a hard sweep with this internal sonogram from one side all the way to the other. And I knew what she was doing when I saw her do it. She was trying to be nice and, and break it through so my wife would have a miscarriage, uh, which is still barbaric to say the least. So mm-hmm. that's what happened. Me and my wife went home and she started to have a miscarriage and she started bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. And we went home at like 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And by 11 p.m., uh, my wife had almost bled to death. And wow. while having a miscarriage in a water closet in our bathroom and what else, you know, just flush the, the fetus, I guess. What else do you do at that point? I mean, it was such a nightmare. Uh, anyway, and then she almost died about 11 p.m. She just passed out on me, still uh, bleeding everywhere and it, it was an absolute nightmare and I called the ambulance and we ended up back at the hospital and we were um, you know they put her on fluids and everything until about 3 a.m. where uh, she finally started recovering right when she was on the cusp of going in for a blood transfusion they actually had her all lined up they were uh, within minutes of taking her out the door and didn't do it but it was um, you know so they kind of throw a blanket at, uh, at the whole thing as if it's just people partying, getting pregnant, and then getting rid of, you know, the evidence or whatever that, that they don't want to deal with. But it's not like that. And it, I'd say it's just like how they try to justify, you know, it's okay if, uh, if, if 50 innocent people go to jail if we got 10 really bad ones, you know, with right. process. No, I don't think that that's correct. I think that, yeah. you know, the free people or the innocent people should be able to live the way that, you know, they need to live healthily. Cause my wife could have died that day. And if she had, you'd be talking to a different person right now, you know? Right. Um, so uh, we have to acknowledge that there, that this isn't just a cut and dry subject and that they can't just, 
we can't put our belief systems on to every single person. We're free to believe the way we want to, but we are not free to force that on everyone else. So, and that's yep. just the end of it. We don't have to get into the morality or, in, or anything of it. It's about uh, individual liberties and or individual sovereignty. And, uh, you know, uh, we'll just leave people to make their choices and we'll leave God to judge as he or she sees fit. And that's all I have. Okay. No, that's a good answer. I, I, I'm sorry your family had to deal with that. It's, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I hate it too, and it's horrible, but um, I, I guess, and I'm I, I'm a horrible uh, optimist that I just find the silver lining in it that it prepared me for what our nation's going through right now. Just, uh, you know, to have a, a good, clean, you know, a, uh, objective outlook for, for the, for the, uh, for the topic. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, and and that, like I say, that is a major issue that's going on right now, and uh, in the United States. Yeah, it's pretty horrible. Um, and you see these stories, and you know, dear God, I mean, it's already a horrible circumstance if you're losing your baby, um, let alone to have to have a brush with death uh, yourself, and then have the very people who are supposed to, you know, be, you know, to save you, yeah. to kind of demonize you on it and send you out the door. Tell you to go let yeah. nature take its course. That nature right. almost took its course, like I said, and that wasn't going to be a good thing. Yeah. So we need to reassess that for sure. No kidding. Yeah, for sure. Well, on that very serious note, uh, I think we'll get into the counter propaganda segment. <laughs> so uh, for counter propaganda, <clears throat> you have, you want to focus on energy and fuel misinformation. So I'm curious, what what energy and fuel misinformation are we discussing here? You know, we went through this whole fuel crisis recently, and biofuels never really came up as a as a mainstream topic, something that we were you know seriously talking about. Uh, and I just don't I don't get it. Right. We're talking about uh, we're talking about fuel shortage or supply shortage. We're talking about the need for uh, an, an abundance of, you know, materials and supplies of fuel. We're also talking about water shortages and depleted soils and all these things. You know, we can keep pushing the margins until we're right at the cliff's edge before we say, hey, hemp is a very, uh, you know, has, has a high utility and is a very useful plant. Uh, and it can do a lot of things to help us right now. And we can wait till it's an absolute necessity. But think about if we do that, if we wait right till the last minute to do it, and then we start doing it and it starts working. What are the people going to say a couple months later after they're like, hey, this is really working. It's improving everything that everybody's going to turn around and be like, hey, why didn't we do this last year? Or why didn't we do this five years ago? Why did we do it 10 years ago? Why did we wait till the last minute before we said, hey, maybe the devil won't pop out of the ground if we start planting hemp seeds? You know, right. that's what I get. Most people are like hemp. Oh, you just want to get high or uh, roots in hell and all that other stuff. I was like, first of all, hemp is uh, it's industrial hemp has nothing to do with marijuana. Right. Yeah. That's not the same thing. It. It's not a psychoactive uh, substance in any fashion. I think it has less than 0.3% uh, THC or something in it. Yeah. Uh, I think if you, if, uh, if you were able to ingest enough of it to get some kind of you know, intoxication, you probably would have died from how much uh, of it you'd already stuffed in yourself. Yeah. Anyway, it's just ridiculous. Um, and that's the propaganda, you know. Um, it's really sad that there's so many people that are still affected by that. And then they're the same people that tell you to go educate yourself. And I'll be like, you know, all right. <laughs> um, but um, no, there's great possibilities. Like I said, it pulls uh, 1.63 tons of carbon out of the air for every ton that's grown. It, wow. uh, it helps pull uh, uh, toxic. Uh, metals and things out of the soil and uh, then it also filters all the water that it uses so it would be taken I don't know if it gets the forever chemicals out of the water but it gets you know pretty much everything out of there so it's quite it's a something bit that we could be utilizing to improve our circumstances dramatically and we're just not doing it not to mention the 10,000 pounds of raw material from each acre uh, every year so we have honestly we have uh, like 700 million acres of depleted soil in America right now. We can plant it all out with hemp and be producing some odd, uh, you know, several trillion pounds 
of raw material every year in addition to what we have. And if we have a supply crisis, why wouldn't we do that anyway? Yeah. Just to fix the soil, just to filter some water, just to clean the air. And um, yeah, so we can solve all these problems at once with, with uh, you know, a couple, you know, multifaceted solutions. And I don't see why we're not doing it. So we were talking about energy and fuel. So um, it's proposed that on 9% of American land, we would grow enough biofuel to provide all the energy for the entire country. And biofuel is pretty much carbon negative because it's not extra carbon before we're pulling out of the ground. It's carbon that's already here. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows how that works. But in any event, it's almost uh, even better than that because uh, at the rate that the plant pulls carbon out of the air. So we're really knocking out more carbon than we're putting back in. Um, mm. If we're not mm. using it all for fuel, if we're using it for other materials and supplies and food and and everything else, so we can absolutely uh, evolve our atmosphere. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but there's a recent study that produced a model for the evolution of uh, of atmosphere, and every planet starts out with a immature biosphere, which is a natural biosphere as it as it starts to develop, and then a mature biosphere, which would have been the the atmosphere before we tampered with it and then when we began to alter it through our processes that will be an immature technosphere and then when we learn from our mistakes and begin to you know alter the atmosphere in a way that's beneficial to our health you know we don't have to call it climate change we can just say we're doing something that's you know beneficial to our longevity Um, so once we accomplish altering the atmosphere uh, you know, to achieve that, it's referred to as a mature technosphere. Now, if we do this hemp revolution by growing out the hemp, causing the economic and raw material boom, uh, we will achieve that that uh, status. We will evolve our atmosphere into the mature technosphere, and it will have, like we we're talking about earlier, a greater abundance of oxygen, where plants will grow. The you know the flora and fauna will flourish. Uh, with uh, greater levels of oxygen. And we've seen that through history uh, where oxygen levels were higher and the plants were bigger and stronger. Yep, yep. No, that's interesting. I, uh, <clears throat> I I guess I've never really given biofuels as much thought. Like, uh, I remember there was a big thing like year a few years ago about, like, corn. They wanted to do a lot of, uh, I guess it was uh, corn-based fuels or canola-based fuels. The ethanol. Yeah. I think that was more of a push for, you know, Monsanto to get subsidies because they could grow their genetically uh, modified corn. So it didn't yeah. really have anything to do with fuel because then they just kind of kicked it to the side. They're like, oh, we'll just cut all the fuel with it. You put up the 10% ethanol and everything just to get rid of it, you know, to have a place to disperse it. But it's really about the corporations collecting the subsidies to run their, their operation. It doesn't really matter if the operation is fruitful or not. So right. uh, that's what I'd say happened there. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I'd put my money on it. (laughs) Yeah. I don't have a document supporting me in front of me, but I would put my money on it. (laughs) Yeah. I guess if somebody wants a citation, then we'll have to figure something out. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm sure they can look at Monsanto's profit margin. So yeah, there's there's your proof. Yeah, that's right. Well, let's get on to, uh, I guess, foes and comrades. So for foes and comrades, for foes, you actually have everyone. Uh, yeah. Most Americans, you say, claim allegiance to our nation, but we dishonor the fallen when we take for granted what we do have. Want me and, to elaborate on that? Yeah, let, let's elaborate on that a little bit. Okay. So I think a great place to pick up on that is uh, child soldier. We see people uh, in America today chain, training their children with assault-style rifles, which are military style rifles or, uh, you know, intended to kill other human beings. Yeah. Um, so we're training children in our country to be soldiers. Like what kind of a statement are we making with that is what we need to look at. So let's look at where child soldiers really do occur in places in Africa and things like that, where, you know, the governments are completely destabilized. The society itself is, you know, destabilized. And it's what we would call a third world country. So the reason that our country is where it is today is because of every soldier that has died to keep it here. 
So if we're saying that our country is in a in a state that we are required to train our soldiers, or excuse me, our children to be soldiers, we're saying that all of that sacrifice, you know, hasn't made our country any better than, you know, these third world countries where it is an absolute necessity. And I'd say that that is disrespectful and it is, you know, it does <clears throat> dishonor the fallen because that's, that's absolutely not what we have. We do have a stable government, whether there's corruption in it or not, whether it's, you know, uh, mostly corruption or not. We still have an operating, you know, functioning government and, uh, you know, police and social system and, uh, you know, firemen and ambulances and everything to help everybody. So we can't uh, we can't act like it's as bad uh, as it is in other places in the world just because our emotions are too caught up in the politics of it. And we should do everything that we can to preserve to preserve the domestic tranquility of our nation. And if you look at the preamble of the Constitution, uh, domestic tranquility is the second definitive term, I believe, uh, that they say we should secure to ourselves. And I'm pretty sure that they knew, uh, you know, that our forefathers knew that psychological health was, uh, you know, was a vital thing. And, and I think it's something that we've let go of. But it's something we need to get back to, uh, and it's definitely a, a mental health crisis. And we we need to address that. So as far as us going around, you know, continuing the uh, habits and uh, the conditioning of demonizing each other and everything else, that's uh, it. Doesn't matter how correct you are in your accusations or anything. Is that a bridge to? you know, to our success as a nation. I don't think it is. It's not where we need to focus. It's like if the house is on fire and we're sitting there just pointing at it that it's on fire, there's only one guy running to grab a bucket of water, you know? It doesn't matter who started the fire. We need to put it out, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, right now everybody's uh, arguing about who started the fire and, and the house is burning. Like, who, who's really correct? I think yeah, the guy I, that's I, trying to put it out. Yeah, I think, I think that that's... Uh... An astute observation. The house, uh, everybody is to sort of to blame, like the everybody with power anyway. And yeah, it, it seems to be like it suits people with power to continue the game of demonizing the other, and you know, so that the, nothing actually has to improve, nothing has to change for the people yeah. who are living their day to day. And it's that simple. It really is. And everybody wants to tie in all these complex, uh, you know, variables and ordeals and laws and circumstances that it is more complicated than that. And it can be, but it doesn't have to be. It's as simple as uh, united we stand, <laughs> divided we fall. That's why that's an, an uh, you know an adage for our country because it's the tr it's an absolute truth. United we stand, divided we fall. If they can keep us divided on a hundred different things, man, that's a hundred steps away from, you know, real success that we will always be. So that's all there is to it. That's why I'm like, I don't care about the labels. I don't care about any of the divisive matters. You know, we're talking about, you know, the uh, uh, peace and prosperity of all people. And if you're not with that, then you're not with the American agenda, because that's what America is about. You know, uh, justice, liberty and justice for all. Yeah, it's it's an interesting idea. I I, I I I come out like I deal a lot in like far left circles. So a lot of kind of people are well, yeah, but that's what's the elites, the power that the powers that be. That's what is wrong with America, right? So, uh, in so, like unless you abandon the concept of America, you're going to be stuck with these power systems. Well, the only reason that it's, you know, we're, we're not on the concepts of America, and that's exactly why things have run so far astray, because America was never supposed to have monopolies, was it? No, it wasn't. And what do we have? Nothing but monopolies, you know? Yeah. Uh, justice was supposed to be equal. Justice isn't equal. Everybody knows the rich people go free. Uh, you know, so it's the fact that we haven't, uh, you know, upheld our country the way it's supposed to be, even the freedom of religion thing. And they're pushing that as far away from us as they can right now. You know, that's that's a, a further breakdown of American ideology. So and, and unfortunately, all the people who call themselves patriots who are also trying to say that this is a Christian nation, you know, right. are absolutely contradicting themselves in every way. But but that's what it is uh, for sure.
Yeah, I I spent a lot of time in the atheist community because uh, that was where I kind of got my start on online uh, podcasting and contact creation. And uh, <clears throat> the idea, like I've, I've had many arguments with Christians who insist that freedom of religion means freedom for them to be Christian and nothing else. Like, and nobody else, you know, it, I don't have the freedom to be free, you know, secular or an atheist. <laughs> like, you yeah. have to have a religion. <laughs> yeah, this comes around a lot, uh, especially for me, because I'm uh, running for president and people want to know. Um, but I'm not, I'm a non-religious person. Uh, but I do have a religion. It's actually my own religion. But, and then they'll be like, well, I'm trying to start a cult. I'm not trying to start a cult either because check this out. My uh, idea about religion is that it should be the same as your vote and nobody's business but your own. I'm right. not out here to talk about my belief system. I believe that it's, you know, each individual's relationship with existence. That's what your religion is going to be. And I don't care what you claim or, you know, even if you claim to be a Christian, you're religion, you know, the way you uh, conduct yourself or, or your moral, you know, structure is going to be based off of your experience with existence. And it's mm -hmm. always going to be there. So that's the way I see it. And uh, but that's that's for me, you know, and I do honor and respect everybody else's religion. And I think that everybody should. Um, other than that, um, you know, once again, it's, it should be the, the, the person's own business. It's kind of the whole point of the individual liberty thing, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And 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 I'm kind of glad that I have that position also because um, you know I get a lot of kickback from it. But I'm like, I mean, you kind of being hypocritical. Uh, you know, what if I start trying to demonize your belief system or the way you believe uh, against you know the way that I believe? I, you right. know, it's an endless argument. That's not. We're never going to get anywhere. Uh, you know, we have to be accepting. And I don't talk about tolerance. I talk about acceptance need to accept things not yeah. tolerate them tolerance is like avoiding being evil we need to you know but it's like saying i am evil but i'm gonna avoid it you know what i mean no we need to just accept people and allow them to uh, you know experience their existence the way it, it happens yep for sure well we're coming close to 40 minutes 45 minutes <clears throat> so i guess is there anything that we haven't touched on that you feel we should yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's a ton of it, but um, you know, I want to, I do want to bring up the narrative uh, with the uh, with the insurrection or the mm -hmm. one six committee and all that, if if, uh, if if you don't mind. Absolutely. So, I, I, and I, and this was where I was kind of uh, teetering on the false narrative thing with with the energy or with the one six committee, because mm -hmm. the way, and this is where I'm kind of opposing the the one six committee itself is that they keep painting the narrative as if uh, what happened on 1-6 was all Donald Trump. It was not. There was, uh, Donald Trump was essentially, he just hijacked energy that was building up in our country for a long time. Um, he didn't you know, go out and make militia groups start forming after Obama got elected. But right. the militia groups shot up 800% after Obama was elected. It wasn't because Trump was out you know, promoting it. Um, there's been a serious distrust with our country for a long time, and that actually exists on both sides. That's why people don't want uh, career politicians. And um, that distrust in the government is what led up to people wanting or thinking that a, a civil war is necessary or that to go do, uh, you know, a violent coup is necessary to take our country back. And that's what really got us to that moment. Trump was nothing but a hijacker. You know, he saw the energy building up and the, he hijacked it, you know, and tried to push it in a direction that was beneficial for himself. And that's all he really was. Now, I'm not saying what he did is not bad. Absolutely. It, right. it was bad. It was horrible. Uh, you know, he opened the door to, to let that monster in. But we have to, as a nation, we really need to recognize that that monster exists with or without Donald Trump. Yeah, it's interesting because I've, I've listened to a lot of stuff and I've read a lot of stuff about like the building of the far right. I mean, the, the militia movements, the white supremacists, the um, neo-Nazis. And, and 
you can really trace a lot of it back to like some pretty extreme rhetoric that was on talk radio back in the 50s. Like <laughs> if you really want to go back like and actually learn where it came from, like you can do that. And no, absolutely, the idea that Donald Trump is responsible for the entire building of this angst and anger. Yeah, all this hatred. Yeah. Yeah. It, this has been part of America for 70 years. Like, you really got to. <laughs> at the very least. At the very least. Yeah, yeah. that's right. You really got to look at it. it. <laughs> yeah, I would say all this, you know, was, I don't say that it's an exact plan, but, you know, the what perpetuates this has been occurring far before Donald Trump was even born. Yeah. So there's no way he could possibly be the cause of, you know, the whole thing. Yeah. And I mean, you think even like to the, the birth of a nation movie back, uh, that with the KKK and, and the resurgence of the KKK back then, like that, that sort of propaganda has been very popular and produ like it's produced a lot of, movements on that side of the political aisle for a long time so yeah it's really not it's not it didn't come out of nowhere it wasn't created in 2016 when donald trump came up it wasn't at all i would say for myself growing up in texas i've heard it my whole life especially when i got old enough to go to bars you know you're sitting in a bar having a couple beers almost every single time as the night dwindled on the conversation was steering to you know somebody would be like hey you know there's going to be a revolution one day right and it's the same rhetoric every time. And usually, you know, there were uh, a good bit of them. It was like our country requires a cleansing in blood. And I have heard that so many times in my life. I really thought it was just a Texas redneck thing. Uh, but what really got my attention and uh, kind of stirred me to do all this was during the George Floyd riots, when I was seeing the, the Trumper parades in Oregon. I was like, isn't Oregon known as like a hardcore leftist area? And like, <laughs> why are they having Trumper parades? I was like, did they drive all the way from Texas? Like, I was really like blown away. I was like, man, these guys are everywhere. I was like, wait, this is a, this is a problem. You know, yeah. um, this isn't just something that, you know, people, old people were talking about in my neighborhood. This is something that's going on everywhere. So that's when I saw the energy of the potential for it. I was like, you know, we really need to make some changes and not just with the whole environment and everything else, the uh, economy, but societally amongst ourselves we need to we need to figure some things out yeah for sure yeah there's a lot of messed up ideas going around and, and like i mean it manifests itself in so many ways now right uh with like the groomer rhetoric around LB lgbt people and like like the uh the crt rhetoric again about teaching history in 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 schools like it's just like just all the anti-rhetoric, yeah, Every, anti-everything. Exactly. Just, uh, uh, I mean, not the anti-fascist, of course, but uh, <laughs> uh, but but yeah, no, I get it. Um, it's 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 like everybody's trying to find their strong point for the fight, you know, um, and what they feel is the easily more easily defendable or you know the best stance, you know, and that they can hold that ground, you know, they're not going to get backed off of their hill. Uh, and everybody's looking for that strong point. But unfortunately, every one of them, even the voters' rights, even the unions, I mean, those are important fights and we need to keep fighting them. But those are not the fights that's going to break the monopoly over our lives. Uh, if we do, Unity is the only thing that's going to do that. So yeah. if we aren't in some fashion working towards that, we're just going to keep riding the merry-go-round. And, and that's, yeah, that's all that's, we've seen. We can expect that. Well. Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, uh, where can people find you and your content? Um, they can look up the Blue Cross Movement uh, for Positive Equality on uh, YouTube, and then, of course, uh, Universal Candid on Twitter. Um, just a fair warning, though, I'm not out here, I'm not your average candidate, because I'm not out trying to sell myself as a character. I've you know, I've written out the proposals clearly, and I'm running on a platform. I'm not running off of being a character or an actor. I right. am me. I'm always going to be me. I'm not perfect. I suck. I'm going to say dumb stuff. I'm going to do idiot stuff. I might trip. I might fall down a ramp. I don't know. But what I do know is that my heart is in the right place for, for, for what we need to do. And the proof is that I've clearly written out the entire movement to do so. And also, if anybody produces a better plan, I'm happy to step down. Okay. Well, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. I certainly appreciate it, sir. 
That's all, folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. It's really appreciated, and it helps me spend more time on this and my other projects. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating or a re- and a review on the podcast app of your choice or on one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser or RateMyPodcast.com would be great. If you want to find more from me, make sure to check out the show notes or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical court. You can find all my social media stuff there, as well as links to my other show, From Many People's Strength, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics, and a project I'm involved in with my friend Damien Marie at Hope that's called Atheist, Humanist, Leftist, Revolutionaries. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty, and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. You can email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. And if you want to be a guest on the show or know someone I should reach out to, then feel free to let me know. You can book interviews in my available time slots on my Calendly, which is also found in my link tree. Thanks so much for listening, and let's try to make sure we're applying critical thinking and reasoned skepticism when we're attacking the system. If we get caught up in bad thinking, we can derail ourselves. <laughs>